as well as uh, he's been heading many advisory boards uh, at America's top physics departments. And today he's going to talk about a topic that is central not only to physics but human civilization. And that is the concept of time itself. A time is a very, a time could be very simple, but it's sometimes it can take up these counterintuitive forms uh, when we think about it. Today in class, I was talking about the delayed choice experiment, for example, and I can see many freshmen here. So, time in itself is an intricate concept, and we can have the time scale right from attoseconds to to uh, 10 or 15 billion years, which is the approximate age of the universe. So in order to, uh, in order to cover this time scale from attoseconds to eons, uh, there, there have been many revolutions within, within human intellect, within the history of human intellect. And uh, as far as I understand from the abstract of Bob's talk, Bob is going to shake our notions about time. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Bob Jeffrey. Please. named after Abdus Salam, who was a hero of mine uh, for many reasons. I met, uh, I met Abdus uh, once when I was a young student. Uh, he doubtlessly would not remember me, but I remember him and his exuberant atmosphere and his love of physics, but also his dedication to the international spirit of science. Uh, you probably know that he was instrumental in founding the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, which is now named after Abdus Salam. And I think that center is a good memento to keep in mind for the way we think about physics in the world at large. Um, today I'm going to talk about time. And uh, please don't think I'm going to explain what time is. That's not going to be my job. It's above my pay grade. Um, what I am going to do is take a journey with you that's guided by a rock. So I brought with me a rock. This is a very special rock. Um, it exemplifies two ways of thinking about the time scale of phenomena in our world. Um, it's a sample of a formation known as the Acasta Formation in northern Canada on the Canadian Shield. Uh, it's a nice, that's a G-N-E-I-S-S, -S. and uh, if I look at it, you probably can't see it, but it's covered with little crystals. These crystals formed about 4.5 billion years ago. This is the, a sample of the oldest solid rock on the surface of the Earth. And uh, it not only exemplifies the expanse of time in, in cosmological terms, but it also is a reminder, as I hope I can show you, of the time scale of fundamental interactions, which is surprisingly short. Um, it's uh, pretty silent. I don't think that you can hear anything coming out of this. Um, it is, however, uh, one third the age of the universe. Here's a time scale. Very often I'm going to flash this time scale. It starts with the formation of the universe about 13.7 billion years ago, and on the other side goes up to modern day. Um, in around 4.5 billion years ago, the Earth formed, and about 4 billion years ago, uh, the Earth has been nice solidified and has been more or less unchanged ever since. Uh, not only does it exemplify this long period of time, but also what I'd like to describe is how deep within here, uh, this piece of rock, are time scales that are infinitesimal to our ears, um, but are the natural time scales for phenomena in the universe. And so there are going to be some very small numbers, some very large numbers in this talk. And one of the great questions I'm going to leave you with, I'm going to leave you with more questions than answers, I'm afraid, um, is how do we reconcile uh, these extremely large differences of, of numerical 
numerical skills and our conception of time. Um, well, let me back up a minute and talk about place in the universe. And uh, I think I'm telling you a short story on one slide that you all know. Uh, for a long time, it was thought that man was the center of the universe. Here's a Ptolemaic picture of the solar system with Earth at the center and the planets and the sun revolving around us. And Copernicus led a transformation of thought in the uh, 17th and the 16th century um, that took the Earth, which there's a symbol for the Earth, uh, out of the center of the universe and placed us in orbit out, out of the, in orbit around the sun. This was the first step in a journey that took Earth further and further out of the center of the universe. Um, it took us to a picture of the Milky Way, where instead of being at the center of the Milky Way, which, by the way, is not a place you'd want to be, um, it turns out we are in a quiet corner of the Milky Way. And not only that, but the Milky Way is not the center of anything in particular. It's one of billions of galaxies that uh, inhabit the uh, observable universe. And although I put us in this particular corner, we might as well be there, but obviously this is not a picture of the Milky Way because we're not far enough to see it. Um, not only did uh, Copernicus initiate a change in the way we perceive our place in the universe, but it also initiated, and this is more in line with what I, what I want to talk about, it initiated a reconsideration of the distance scales over which the phenomena of physics play out. Um, in Aristotelian times, physics was a, con a set of concepts that were formulated at a human scale, meters, kilometers, centimeters, fractions of a, fractions of a centimeter. But as we appreciated more the uh, lack of centrality of human experience, we became uh, aware that the drama of physics plays out at very different distance scales, from femtometer particle physics scales to the scales of atomic physics, human scales at uh, of order one meter, and then upwards to the scale of uh, cosmology and the observed universe. So we've come to appreciate the distinction in the scales of uh, the length scales of physics, and we've traded uh, a rather um, uh, confused picture of what the significance of the large scale structure of the universe or a more nuanced picture and a richer picture. It used to be uh, that we populated our night sky with images of things that we somehow believed were human in reference. Here's some constellations uh, formed out of the night stars. And here's a picture of the universe as it was uh, thought about uh, in the uh, late Middle Ages. Um, and, you know, these are pictures that inspired literature and art, but also now we replace them with pictures of a universe which in many ways is a richer picture of the universe, in which dynamics plays out on, a, on an astronomical scale, in which stars are born and die, in which black holes are created and black holes merge. Um, we've got a richer view of the universe as a consequence of our appreciation of the fact that we're not the center of it. And uh, what I would like to do is to describe a transformation that's happening more quietly uh, in science without all of the excitement of the Copernican revolution, but a transformation in the way we think of time scales. Um, nature's laws, uh, we used to think played out in the time scales that a human body is uh, sensitive to in terms of seconds and minutes and hours and days and years. But in fact, the natural time scales of phenomena in physics are far removed from the scales that are familiar to human beings. Um, they're played out on time scales that range over 40, sorry about that, uh, range over 40 orders of magnitude um, from uh, of order 10 to the minus 24 seconds to 10 to the 16 seconds, from the time scales of fundamental physics to the time scales of cosmological physics. And the human time scales, which sit in this green band ranging from about one second to about 100 years, sit in a region which is devoid of natural time scales of physics. So a question that immediately arises is, how did it happen that we're set up to be perceive and be sensitive to phenomena at a time scale that bears little or no relation to the fundamental clock speeds of modern physics? Um, 
And so I'd like to first try to convince you of what those timescales are, and then talk a little bit about how, in the end, how human timescales emerge from the fundamental laws of physics. Um, it certainly seemed obvious in the days of Copernicus and before that um, the timescales of the universe were the ones that people were sensitive to, the rhythms of light and dark, the monthly fall and rise of the tides, the uh, sun going up and down in the sky as a function of the seasons of the year. Um, it seemed absurd for pre-modern man to think that the universe obeyed different rules of uh, time than the ones that were naturally surrounding us. Um, as modern physics or modern classical physics began to emerge in the 17th and 18th century, it became clear that the laws of classical physics select no time scale as a fundamental scale. Um, the concept of a scale for time vanished from the laws of physics when Newtonian gravity and Maxwellian electrodynamics were formulated. Um, there is no intrinsic time scale at all. For the cognoscenti uh, physics majors in the audience, uh, the Maxwell equations <coughs> and Newtonian gravity are scale invariant. They're conformally invariant, in fact. Um, uh, an example of this is Kepler's laws of motion. Uh, the natural period of motion of an orbiting body in a gravitational field is not determined by some clock speed that's built into Newton's laws. It simply grows with the size of the orbit in this famous Keplerian law that period squared goes like a semi-major axis uh, cube. Um, the first change in this thinking occurred with, the, with Planck's discovery that there is a quantum of energy, which is now known as Planck's constant. And although this did not set any natural timescales for the phenomena of physics, it correlated the clock speed of events in physics with the energy scale over which those events, are, uh, in which those energies in which those events are taking place. So uh, Planck's famous equation, which is right up there with Einstein's E equals mc squared, is it something you should engrave on stone, is that uh, the energy uh, change in phenomena is related to Planck's constant times the frequency, which is one over the period. So the frequency is the clock speed. So any process that involves a change in energy has a natural clock speed associated with it. And uh, the... Um, uh, Planck's constant, however, is extremely small. So if I solve for the time scale by dividing uh, that equation by the uh, energy, by the frequency, and calling one over frequency the time scale, um, then because Planck's constant is so small, then even very small amounts of energy correspond to astonishingly short time scales. So uh, for example, green light, which we all think of as a kind of everyday phenomena, corresponds to a vibration of the electromagnetic field which is of the order of 10 to the 15th vibrations per second. So the natural clock speed associated with green light is one part in 10 to the 15th seconds. Incredibly short time speed by any perception of human uh, senses. Um, now, the, uh, those of you who, who uh, have been following what I'm saying, uh, we'll realize that just saying that energy is proportional to frequency doesn't set a clock speed into the laws of physics either. We have, we have, what we have to do is to ask, what is the natural scale of energy that pervades fundamental phenomena? If we had a natural scale of energy, then we could decide on the natural scale of uh, phenomena and the natural scale of the um, phenomena that pervade the universe. Um, it turns out that uh, Buried deep in the structure of materials, there is a natural time scale, and it's the natural time scale uh, determined by the uh, breaking of scale invariance, uh, the, a phenomenon called dimensional transmutation that occurs in the theory of the strong interactions of quarks that bind particles together. Um, let's uh, take this journey slowly and start uh, where we are in this rock and slowly drill down one layer after another deeper into it, looking for some natural clock speed. At first, as we blow up the rock, we see some crystalline structure. It looks very static. As we blow it up further, 
the crystals get larger. There's nothing that shows any motion whatsoever or any sense of, of time. Um, finally, when we get down to distance scales slightly larger than molecules, we start to notice that the crystal structure of that atom is actually of those atoms is actually vibrating, and this vibrational scale is characterized by time scales of the order of 10 to the minus 14 seconds. And these are time scales that are characteristic of the energies involved in crystalline vibrations. We go even further into individual atoms. Uh, we see that the electron cloud in an atom is moving. Uh, it's got a natural cadence associated with the binding energy of an atomic electron, which is 13 electron volts. If I plug that into the formula of Planck's, it tells me that the natural clock speed of electromagnetic interactions in an atom is of the order of 10 to the minus 16 seconds. If we try to continue going further, um, we find that uh, the atoms resolve slowly into electron clouds um, and the electromagnetic time scale fades away. Uh, there's nothing much inside atoms as we look down to higher resolution. Um, there's nothing to replace the time, the energy scale of atoms. There's a great empty space within atoms. Finally, at higher and higher, at shorter and shorter distances, we begin to resolve an atomic nucleus at the center of an atom. And inside the atomic nucleus, uh, there's a, it's too, too small for you to see, but this atomic nucleus actually has protons and neutrons inside it. And if we go a little bit further, we see that when we get to the times with distance scale of about 10 to the minus fifth the size of an atom, protons and neutrons are swarming around in the nucleus at a time scale set by this fundamental interactions that bind <coughs> protons and neutrons together. Um, this time scale is determined by the fundamental structure of quantum chromodynamics and is of the order of 10 to the minus 24 seconds. So inside a proton and a neutron, there are fluctuating quantum fields and those the, the clock speed for those fluctuating fields is, which I've got a picture here, courtesy of our friends who do lattice quantum chromodynamics calculations, a picture of the fluctuating quark and gluon fields inside of a nuke, inside of a proton. And there, uh, finally, is an, a set of equations describing the fundamental structure of matter in which there is a natural clock speed set. And this is uh, the first time in the equations of nature that there is a natural time speed. Um, and for the experts, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, except for the tri trivial and inconsequential quark masses, which are determined by other physics, the breaking of conformal invariance in quantum chromodynamics sets the scale for the masses, the sizes, and the time scale of all the standard model physics. So deep within this rock, very far below our ability to see, are throbbing clocks of protons and neutrons inside of which quarks are vibrating with this fundamental time scale, which is 16 orders of magnitude smaller uh, than what we normally think of as a second. Um, this is kind of recapitulating what I just said. Uh, there's, we've now established a, a marker on the spectrum of times of order 10 to the minus 24 seconds which characterizes the natural time scale of phenomena uh, in the universe. Um, the basic interactions of chemistry and biology are languishingly slow at this point. They're of the order of 10 to the 15th um, uh, vibrations of this fundamental clock for every, uh, time, every interval of activity on the molecular and chemical time scale. Um, one of the things I'd like to convince you of is that when you think about phenomena as being evanescent, we think we who do particle physics talk uh, casually about particles who live, which live 10 to the minus 10 seconds or 10 to the minus 18 seconds. And popular perception is these are incredibly short times. How can something be interesting if it lives 10 to the minus 10 seconds? Well, actually, these lifetimes are incredibly long and they describe incredibly stable systems. 
So for example, there's a particle called the lambda particle, which all you need to know about it is that it lives 10 to the minus 10 seconds. It's like a proton or a neutron, but one of the quarks is a little different. And after about 10 to the minus 24 seconds, it becomes unstable. Uh, 10 to the minus 10 seconds, it becomes unstable and decays into other stuff. Um, it leaves a track that looks a little bit like a lambda. This doesn't look much like a lambda. There's one leg and there's the other leg. It's sort of a lambda on its side. Um, it's a bound state uh, that looks evanescent, but the, in terms of the orbit of the quarks inside the lambda, the quarks inside the lambda orbit of the order 2 times 10 to the 14th times during its lifetime. This is a system that hangs together 10 to the 14th times in terms of its own natural clock speed. It's incredibly stable. Um, if, for example, we cons consider it compared to things we, in our world of seconds, minutes, and hours, think of as being long-lived, um, it's lasted longer than the pyramids. You know, the pyramids and the ruins of ancient civilization have been around 4,000 years, which is about 10 to the 11th seconds. Um, the Grand Canyon's been around a few times longer. Even the solar system, the solar system is only expected to be stable against disintegration uh, for a few billion uh, of the natural time scale, which is the orbit of the Earth. And after that time, some of the planet uh, chaotic phenomena take over and expel some of the planets from the solar system. And even uh, at the same time scale, the sun will become a nova and the solar system will no longer be there. So in terms of its own internal clock speed, this lambda hyperon, this lambda particle, is far more stable than the solar system. It's just that because we're linked into our anthropocentric perception of time, we insist on doing things in terms of seconds, that we fail to appreciate the long, slow lifetime of the lambda particle. Um, so now comes a we're kind of halfway through this journey. We've drilled down to the shortest time scales that are meaningful in terms of physics. And uh, we're naturally confronted with a problem. Uh, the problem is given that phenomena in physics play, play out in time scales of 10 to the minus 24 seconds, how come the universe uh, is 10 to the 17 seconds long? Why is the lifetime of the universe, which is after all made up of fundamental particles, why has it lasted 10 to the 41 cycles? in terms of the clocks of fundamental interactions. Um, so I'd like to take this journey in the other direction, go outward to look at long time scales, um, and ask why is the universe so old? And this is one of the questions that's just going to lead us to another question. So um, bear with me. Um, um, if we start with uh, at the scale of seconds, minutes, and hours, and we work our way out, we find during this period between the strong interactions, the electromagnetic interactions, and going outward, we find no clock speeds in nature until we get to the cosmological time scale of 10 to the 17 seconds. So uh, the first question I want to ask is where, where is that time scale coming from, 10 to the 17 seconds? Where did, how did nature impress upon the universe such a time scale? Um, and that turns out to be a, a very new a, a question that has a very not new and exciting and perplexing answer. Uh, it used to be that before the advent of modern cosmology, and even until very recently, there was in fact no time scale for the large scale structure of the universe. You could talk about the universe being a certain age, but that was just happened to be how long it had pre persisted, as opposed to is there something ingrained in the fundamental equations of physics that dictates a time scale of order 10 to the 17 seconds. And around in the year 2000, it was discovered uh, that there is a natural phenomenon that uh, called the dark energy, which defines a time scale for the evolution of the universe. And that time scale is of the order of 10 million years. It happens to be to coincide with the lifetime of stable, long-lived stars and that's why we're here to talk about such a universe. Um, so let me start this outward time scale with Einstein. Einstein observed the universe, and uh, given his equations of general relativity, um, he looked at the universe and saw that it appeared to be static. And he thought the universe, he assumed, was static. 
and eternal. And um, in that case, there was no time scale for this large scale evolution of the universe at all. And uh, Einstein's picture turned out to be wrong. It was discovered uh, in the 1920s by Erwin Hubble that the universe has expanded. It's neither static nor eternal. It started at some point and it started expanding and has expanded ever since. And it appeared to be slowing down due to the gravitational pull of the matter. And in this picture, the universe would expand forever, becoming ever more diffuse and finally ending up arbitrarily large and arbitrarily diffuse. That picture, Hubble's picture of the universe, has no time scale in it either. Uh, it proceeds in a scale invariant way, and we just happen to have appeared at a time scale of 10 to the 10th years, uh, roughly 10 billion years. So there was no time scale for cosmology. Um, the universe is simply expanding at like spots on a balloon. Um, and then in the mid-1990s, astronomers uh, led by Saul Perlmutter of Berkeley uh, discovered that actually there is another uh, um, phenomenon in the universe um, which is, appears to be fundamental. It's characterized by an energy density. It's called the dark energy. The energy density is about 10 to the minus 9 joules per cubic meter. That's a really small energy density. But when you add it all up, and there's so many cubic meters in the universe, it accounts for about 70% of all the energy density in the universe. And the stuff that we see, the atoms, of course, many of you have heard this before. I'm taking a different twist on it. Um, the atoms in the universe account for about 4.5% of all the energy in the universe. Um, but this energy density in the vacuum, this dark energy, uh, drives an acceleration it turns around the slow decrease of the expansion of the universe into an acceleration. And the time scale over which the universe changes from slowly uh, decreasing its rate of expansion to rapidly increasing its rate of expansion is a natural time scale for cosmology. It appears in Einstein's equations as a cosmological constant on the other side of Einstein's equation. It's a parameter of nature, and it defines a time scale for cosmology. Um, and here it is, for those of you who like equations, if you take the speed of light squared divided by Newton's constant and the dark energy density, you get a time. And that time scale, that time is the time over which uh, uh, the, um, here's a picture of the dominance of the uh, universe by the energy density of matter in blue, changing over to a universe dominated by dark energy in red. And this occurs at a roughly 10 billion years. And interestingly, it happens to be the time scale over which human life has developed. And we'll come back to that uh, toward the end of my talk as an a attempt to understand where human time scales come into the picture. Um, so uh, if, you, if you've been following me critically, you'll say, uh, the puzzle of the age of the universe has just been replaced by the puzzle of why is the dark energy so small. Um, if the dark energy had been, if this parameter E, the dark energy, had been an energy characteristic of the energy scale of the chromodynamic interactions that set the time scale for fundamental physics, the universe would have popped into and out of existence on a time scale of order of fraction of tiny fractions of a second. Mm -hmm. So the mystery of why the universe is so old has been replaced by the mystery of why the dark energy is so small. Um, now, people have looked for explanations for this dark energy, and the explanation uh, have failed <coughs> resoundingly to provide a scientific explanation for why there is a dark energy and why it is so small. And the, um, one of the really interesting ideas that's come out of this is the idea of a multiverse, the idea that our universe is part of a larger structure in which universes are created, uh, live for some time, and then uh, either expand beyond anything happening or contract back upon themselves. And that behavior of the universe is determined uh, by the size of the dark energy. 
And the idea is that universes are born with different values of this dark energy, and only the ones whose dark energy parameter is small enough uh, live long enough for observers to evolve and to see the universe. Now, if you start thinking about universes winking in and out of existence, it seems like an unreasonably long time scale to be thinking about events. I mean, after all, here, everything we know and have seen and will ever know and will ever see is enclosed in one universe, in one very quiet corner of one universe. But we have to free ourselves from this Copernican, uh, this Ptolemaic uh, stricture on the way we think of time. And if we view the event of creation and destruction of the universe, with the same freedom from being tied down, we would be led to think of universes winking into and out of existence uh, as events in a larger manifold. You can see I'm losing my audience here. Um, but there's plenty of time. Um, <laughs> So you may notice a similarity between this picture and the picture that I used to define fundamental times of quarks and gluons uh, fluctuating inside a proton. And the, the uh, coincidence is, in, of course, intentional. This is meant to be a picture of um, universes winking in and out of existence in the multiverse. And uh, in the natural time scale of cosmology defined by the cosmological constant, this is a series of events no more slow or fast than the series of events that occurs at the chromodynamic level inside the proton. So we're left with uh, these two pictures. What are we looking at here? Are we looking at an image of quarks fluctuating inside a proton on the time scale of 10 to the minus 24 seconds, slowed down so that we can view it on a screen in our own time scale? Or are we looking at an image of the multiverse showing it, the universe is winking out of the, in and out of existence over 10 to the minus, over 10 to the 17th seconds. Um, so uh, I'd, now, I'd now like to pause. We've gone out as far as we can. And I'd like to ask, how did we get to the place where we live? Uh, here's this landscape from very short fundamental times to very long cosmological times. Um, where did the human time scale come from, of seconds to years? Um, why is the tempo of life organized in terms of seconds, days, and years? And here I have to admit the obvious answer is, I think, obvious to everyone. Uh, these are the time scales of celestial mechanics. The time over which the Earth goes around the sun, the time over which the moon goes around the Earth, the time over which the Earth spins on its axis, these obviously set the time scales of human life and of all life forms. Um, and that, the fact that they set that scale is a consequence of natural selection. The, the, light, the patterns of light and dark, of uh, being able to hide from predators and being able to seek out uh, mates for reproduction, were defined by the cadences of nature. And uh, they, this natural selection linked forced biological time scales to link to celestial motion. Remember, biological time scales are inherently very short. They're of the time scales of atomic interactions. But uh, they've aggregated themselves and slowed down and uh, shaped themselves to the natural time scales forced by uh, celestial mechanics. Um, but hidden in this obvious statement that the time scales of human life are forced by celestial mechanics, there's another puzzle. And it's another large number puzzle. Remember, we already have one large number puzzle, which is why is the time scale set by the dark energy 41 orders of magnitude larger than the time scale of the fundamental interactions. But there's another uh, large number here, and that number uh, is uh, that long-lived stars like our sun involve about 10 to the 59th protons. And along with the length, lifetime of a star is determined by a complex set of processes involving strong interactions that cause fusion of protons, and weak interactions that allow those fusions to take place, the electromagnetic interactions uh, that propagate the energy of fusion away out of the star and above all, the force of gravity, which is so weak that it requires of the order of 10 to the 59th baryons, protons, 
in order to create a large enough central pressure to ignite the process of fusion. Um, so uh, the, time, uh, the time of our lives, the, the time scales of our clocks are determined by the comparative weakness of gravity compared to the uh, time scale set by the natural forces at, at, in the fundamental scale between 10 to the minus 24 and 10 to the minus 16 seconds. Um, this is a picture that's uh, used in the discussion of exoplanets. This is a picture of different stars at different masses ranging from about 0.3 uh, to up to two solar masses. Uh, this is the solar system laid out in astronomical units with the Earth here at one astronomical unit. And this blue band is the habitable zone around our uh, around the, the star in question, ranging from about one tenth the orbit, uh, one tenth the radius of the Earth's orbit, up to about five to ten times the radius of the Earth's orbit. Um, planets that orbit around these stars have <coughs> lifetimes, have uh, year long, year lengths that are of the order of one tenth to ten times the length of our year. Um, I want to emphasize that this is a natural characteristic of the equations of nature, but it's driven by the incredibly small size of the gravitational, Newton's gravitational constant compared to the other constants of nature. Um, but it means that this is a natural time scale for life throughout the universe. In our universe, stars that can live for a long time, which are stars in the, this range from about 0.3 to two solar masses that have lifetimes ranging from hundreds of billions of years to hundreds of millions of years, perhaps long enough for natural selection to breed intelligent observers, they will have uh, time scales of the order of years. Um, they will breed creatures that live on Earth-sized planets. So uh, when we encounter life forms from other planets, I found a life form from another planet here that illustrate this <laughs> subject. Um, when we find life forms from other planets, their size and their longevity, we should not expect to find life forms that live hundreds of millions of years in our units, nor should we expect to find life forms that live for microseconds in our units. They, their lifetimes will be determined by the time scales of their celestial mechanics, and their celestial mechanics will be of the same order as our celestial mechanics. So, I'm coming to the end. Let me summarize. Um, our Copernican journey through the time scales of the universe has led us to some, uh, I hope, to reshape some problems in a different language. They haven't solved the problems, but they've taken us from fundamental times, which are of the order of 10 to the minus 24 seconds, um, up to the time scale of cosmology, and that's the consequence or the fault of the tininess of the dark energy density. Um, and they've taken us into the land in between um, where there's no <coughs> fundamental time that dictates the human scale over which our clocks beat. Uh, but the weakness of gravity compared to fundamental forces results in stability for stars which dictate time scales of the order of seconds to years for the celestial mechanics of long-lived stars. Uh, so, uh, we've ended up, I, I hope it's been a, a useful journey. We started uh, with a, a link to the time scales of human life, and we've gone to two extremes. Um, both of these extremes are uh, very different from human time scales, the time scale of fundamental interactions, over which quarks and gluons struggle to be free from inside of protons the time scale of fluctuations of, the, of universes, uh, perhaps, uh, dictated by the energy scale of dark energy. And we're left with two rephrasings of questions that are still out there and command the attention of any serious theoretical physicist. Uh, two questions. One is, why is the dark energy density so small? These are really the gold-plated challenges for modern uh, large-scale physics thinking. And second, why is gravity so much weaker than the fundamental interactions that determine the lifetimes and sizes of stars? So with that, I thank you. And uh, once again, I'm happy to honor this. <laughs>
not will be density and variance constants. Why they are can you relate them somehow? So the so the dark energy is small in natural units. Um, the uh, ten to the forty one factor of ten to the one forty one smaller than the natural unit for fundamental interactions. Planck's constant is small for a different reason. Planck's constant is a dimensional constant, and it's small when you measure it in terms of meters, uh, kilograms, and seconds. And uh, I personally believe that Planck's constant is small because a living and perceptive being has to include many quanta. So if, in order to build an object that, like you or me, that's capable of asking the question you ask, <laughs> We need to have many, many atoms, many nuclei, many molecules, and the, the action in the formal sense of physics action, Planck's constant is units of action. The action has to be a huge multiple of Planck's constant to have so much information stored in a human being. So in fact, if, you, if we uh, finally discover extraterrestrial life by communication, you know, if SETI ever succeeds in with communicating with another culture, and we finally figure out how to discuss quantum mechanics, and we send them and we say, uh, how big is Planck's constant in your natural units? And if they say two, we know they're lying. <laughs> because in any, any perceptive being must have a value of Planck's constant, which is incredibly small. And it's not, it has nothing to do with these puzzles. Yes, please. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Thank you. Descending from the looping, I hope uh, I might be into a room in the heart. Question which uh, probably may not be strictly a scientific question, rather a philosophical question. Uh, and it is about the human mind. It is amazing to me that uh, the human mind, in its close posture, as it were, can discover the educated mode of uh, mathematics. And not only that, it can, by using that instrument, our mathematics covers a lot of things in its solitary confinement. So I see a sort of single trinity here between mind, mathematics, and matter. Uh, and the amazing thing to me is that uh, the uh, undirected proceed of evolution to create such an instrument, which uh, my way of thinking has had primacy. And I think it has primacy probably, although I'm not a mathematician, uh, in the uh, question of uh, quantum mechanics. So this is rather strange, but I must end with, uh, with saying that uh, no apologia is the <coughs> So um, let me make a couple of comments. First of all, no, no single human mind invented physics. The, the thing that makes physics wonderful is that it builds like a pyramid on the work of pe people over ages. Um, the, the work of Aristotle led to the work of Copernicus, led to the work of Galileo. Mm -hmm. And if you took a modern physicist and stuck them in a room and said, explain nature, you know, educated them in all the methods of mathematics and just stuck them in a room and explained nature, Vicky Weisskopf said maybe they could derive the notion of a solid Maybe they could figure out the notion of a gas, but they would never invent the notion of a liquid. So the, the, the human mind is actually a rather blunt tool, and it's only because we tie them all together with a thread of knowledge and teach one another that we can get everywhere. Um, the second thing I wanted to say has to do with the relevance of mathematics to physics. Uh, great people have written uh, extensively about that and puzzled about it. Um, Eugene Wigner wrote a paper in the early 1960s called The Unreasonable Applicability of Mathematics to Science. And uh, the best I can do with that is that, that human beings are made of the same material that we're trying to explain. And we evolved uh, out of a context that was built on those phenomena. So our minds are hardwired to be cognizant, to, be, to organize the material around us. Chomsky argued that the human mind is an organ that has evolved uh, that independent of the tissue of the brain. And that, uh, well, I'm not going to try to 
explain Chomsky, I'd be way over my pay grade. <laughs> um, but the, the notion that humans are well adapted to explain the world in terms of our logical tools is something that makes sense in terms of evolution. Yes, please, sir. Uh, is time uh, a many body phenomenon or an emergent phenomenon? Because so it seems that if we just had the invariant and didn't have the fundamental forces, the notion of time wouldn't have emerged. Well, that's a that's a really deep question. There are people who believe that space time is an emergent phenomenon um, and try to um, construct dynamical theories in which it does, but they're very hard to formulate. And uh, there's a, at this point no successful picture of that. I, I wouldn't know how to express dynamics outside of the context in which time is prior and prior. So I guess this is another thing which is above my pay grade. It's, you know, it's a very interesting speculation that time should be an emergent phenomenon, but it's hard to imagine that space would not also be an emergent phenomenon given the connection of relativity. We have a question here. Um, normally, we experience uh, three spatial dimensions and one temporal dimension. So, uh, this is often say that there are more spatial dimensions out there, but I have not heard about any theories about more temporal dimensions. About, I'm sorry? More temporal dimensions, time dimensions. Yes. So, why is that? Um, I'm not an expert on this, but I believe the theories that try to have two time dimensions get in trouble with uh, internal consistency. Um, and uh, I don't think I can dredge up the reason for that at the moment. But I think if you, there is a literature on the subject, and I think the problem is internal consistency. It's easy to extrapolate from one to two to three to four dimensions of space. Um, but in, with time, you know, time relative to space, one time relative to n spatial dimensions is consistent with the notion of causality. So we have a light cone and influence propagates at the speed of light, which is the rate of change of space with time. And if you have two times, you have the potential for a really difficult formulation of causality. And if you have, don't have a theory which is causal, um, you don't have a consistent theory of No, um, the universes that I was showing in that slide, we can watch them fluctuate for a while. Um, there they go. Um, this, is a, this is an inadequate illustration. Um, some of these universes that have extremely large cosmological constants would uh, uh, die would, would collapse upon themselves or expand away uh, exponentially in, in uh, timescales that we would perceive as being essentially instantaneous. Furthermore, each unif if, if these pictures are right, and I have to say they're very, they're very speculative, each of these universes would be endowed with its own set of, of standard models, uh, laws of nature. So instead of quantum chromodynamics, there might be some other equations that govern fundamental interactions. There might be two kinds of photons. Um, there might be, uh, uh, instead of three colors of quarks, there might be seven colors of quarks. And, um, the, and they might be you know, rad radically different dynamical pictures with different time scales. Um, the point I was trying to make here is that the um, dynamics of the multiverse in its own context is full of events. And those events that we don't think of the creation of the universe, the life of the universe as being an event. We think of it as being everything. But in the scale of the multiverse, the uh, particular universe's trajectory is simply an event. Maybe one last question. Okay. Uh, but, uh, 
this is not my area, so pardon my ignorance on this, but you s- spoke about the the dark energy or the discovery of dark energy bringing the time dimension or time scale to the evolution of the, the, the universe, let's say. Does the antimatter have any role in this? Or is there anything that's just speculation? Um, I think the short answer is no. Antimatter and matter um, are uh, a natural consequence of the laws of field theory as we understand them. And our present belief is that when our universe was born, um, antimatter and matter were both tremendously abundant. And, and But in the symmetry between matter, matter and antimatter, which is called uh, CP invariance, was a very good symmetry, but with a tiny violation in the fundamental laws of physics. And as the universe cooled and the matter and antimatter annihilated, uh, there was just a little matter left over. And that 4% that we see is the matter that's left over. So it doesn't play a role in this kind of But has it played a role? In the past. In the past. Uh, in the very early universe, the expansion <laughs> of the black, of, of the uh, Big Bang, um, the pressure that was that, that controlled the expansion of the Big Bang and the temperatures that were in excess of uh, GV, yes, the, the contribution of antimatter was essential. Factor of two. Bob, I, I missed in the equation you had in the denominator for time, uh, E. Was E the energy density or the total energy in the universe? It's the energy density. So as the universe is expanding, that means the time scale is changing? No, the, black, the dark energy density is uh, something that comes with the territory. As more space is created by the expansion of the universe, it comes with the same energy density. Um, so how so, do we rationalize that with energy not created or displaced? So uh, that's a good question. In the context of an exponentially inflating universe, energy is not conserved. I mean, energy is conserved when the laws of, having just written a big book on the physics of energy, this, this one is not above my pay grade, I can't make out on it. Energy is, cons- energy is a conserved quantity in the context of any physical theory in which the laws of nature are time invariant. And in an exponentially inflating universe, the, uh, un- the laws of nature are certainly not time invariant, because the laws are not exponential. Uh, Bob, um, this, uh, of multiple universes is, it comes from a proposed mathematical solution that is supposed to be applicable within certain constraints. Mathematical is a compliment, actually. <laughs> <Part of mathematical. laughs> so, uh, so uh, is uh, math uh, leading uh, the understanding of the fundamentals of physics, or is it physics leading it, or do they go back and forth? Um, they, they go back and forth, but I think this is a place where we have to give due credit to string theory, uh, which those of you who know my physics would be hear me, would consider me uh, violating some fundamental rule by saying this. But uh, string theory really led us to consider uh, a physical framework in which a multiverse was conceivable. Because in string theory, the world is, uh, the um, there's a landscape of possible structures determined by the minima of some very complicated function over a very large manifold. And each of those minima represent a set of laws of nature and a value for the dark energy, and therefore a possible universe. And in a a dynamics where there is an underlying manifold that's expanding and these minima, uh, these local regions settle out in these minima, um, they form these universes that we see fluctuating in this picture. So this is definitely a case where the mathematics of string theory, stimulated by trying to marry quantum mechanics with gravity, uh, led to a, uh, a picture that could be exploited to give a justification for the multiverse. I think we come to the end of our uh, lecture. Uh, One thing interesting, fascinating about physics is, you know, the more I try to understand, it creates more questions than answers. That's why I find it very interesting. So uh, I'd like you to join hands to thank Professor Bob.
we hope that you can keep visiting us. It's, 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 it's a pleasure and continues to be a pleasure.